My name is Matthew Godin. I'm working for Code Play Software uh, LTD. And uh, in the next talk, I'm going to explain to you the use of SQL for uh, accelerating uh, machine learning based framework on OpenCL enabled device. And uh, by machine learning framework, I specifically mean TensorFlow. So, as you know, machine learning has been widely used in different areas. Uh, you have seen different talk today that pretty much all of them are talking about machine learning and AI techniques inside their own areas and field of uh, expertise that they are working. From image recognition, self-driving car vehicle, in scientific physics and simulation, everywhere, basically. Existing frameworks at the moment uh, the most popular one are TensorFlow, Kafka, TinyGen, and Theano. And uh, the common problem is pretty much most of them is they don't support OpenCL, except Kafka, which there is an OpenCL backend for it. None of the other ones support OpenCL. And they don't allow you, to, by not, but even if, if they support OpenCL, if you want to port it from one platform to another platform, Still, you need to tune it for that particular platform because they don't support performance portability if you want to, to have a high performance streaming application. And if you go to the embedded system, the issue would be that more embedded system <coughs> tend to have a small size of the memory, so there is a huge computational and communication demands. And the power, the memory size, and all of them are constrained. And we need to generate a high efficient and accurate result from So, the reason that we select TensorFlow was, one of the reasons was it, it actually absorbed a lot of interest from different communities, from different fields, to use TensorFlow for their particular work. The reason is it's a graph-based framework, and it allows anyone to model it in a low level if they want, or in a high level that they want. So it's a layer-based framework that anyone can write their code from any level that they want. So the front end of TensorFlow is a graph-based model. And as the name of the framework suggests, it uses Tensor as an input data or output data. And there are units of computation, which they call it operations. In the back end, they support different architectures. So as you can see from this uh, figure, here, the front part of this figure is basically a client part of the code. It can be a Python code, it can be C++ code. On top of that, if you want to basically write a numerical graph based diagram, if you want to use the li existing library, you can use any of training or inference library that they have. And there is a C API level here, which basically uh, create a unified a view from all of these different language for the core backend of the TensorFlow. In the core backend of the TensorFlow, there is a distributed master and data flow executor. The job of this thing is to launch, basically to capture any subgraph from the TensorFlow graph, and then optimize it if it's possible, and launch it in different devices or different nodes if needed. And the data executor, data flow executor, are responsible for control of the flow of the data which is passing through the graphs. Behind this scene, there is a kernel implementation. And this kernel implementation is the part which contains all the core kernel of the TensorFlow, like constant, var, matrix multiplication, convolution, ReLU, Q, all of these are here. And this kernel implementation can be either a built-in kernel implementation, or they can use existing library for different devices, like uh, in video CUDA, they can use CUDA DNN whenever it's possible. They can they will use gem low power uh, library for the TensorFlow Lite, for the mobile ba version of the TensorFlow, or anyone can write their own embedded built-in kernel, basically as an ad hoc kernel inside that backend. But the main backend of the TensorFlow is EigenTensor, which most of the numerical algebraic operation, linear algebraic operation, goes to this uh, EigenTensor library. So basically, all the kernel that you can see here 
when you are using the uh, TensorFlow default version, not for particular vendor specified. It uh, basically is a registry to the actual uh, backend implementation of the linear algebra library, which is idle. So that's the reason that when we want to add the TensorFlow, when we want to add our OpenCL backend to the TensorFlow, we need to be non-intrusive. We need to be, you know, we need to add it in a way that we don't break any existing uh, system that they, they, they developed so far. So the code should work, the front end should not change. And in the back end, when you're trying to add the back end, you should be able to uh, we should be able to avoid but about enabling any backend which can disable other backends. So back into the architecture, the best way that we can add this backend is by not touching all of this gray side and leave it as it is, and coming and implementing our core kernel implementation here, registering our kernel for item and putting all the linear and enabling the idle tensor to run on this uh, run linear algebra on OpenCL enabled device. So in that case, all of the registry that they have already done for eigen will go to our uh, eigen tensor and use OpenCL enabled device that we, we wanted to be used in eigen. Yeah. Another thing that needs to be enabled here is the device layer, as you can see here. The device layer will choose the selected device and disable the rest of the code for other device. And allow the, allow the path that has been selected from the, this top layer to go through the particular device which has been selected here. And based on that, it chooses the particular device in an item. So the main task here for us is basically implement, make, enabling the linear algebra library for item. In order to do that, we choose SQL because of the following reasons. First of all, I explained SQL and how does it work. Probably many of you know what SQL is. How many of you know what SQL is? So none of you know SQL. <laughs> so I explained what SQL is. SQL is an open standard generated by Chorus Group. And we are using here in, uh, in code the our implementation of the SQL, which is Compute CPP. SQL provides the cross-platform portability. So basically, when SQL came, uh, <coughs> uh, it tried to create one layer higher level than OpenCL on top of OpenCL in order to allow user to run the C++ code, complete C++ code, and one single source C++ code which can run on uh, uh, basically uh, OpenCL enabled device. So this is a typical SQL example. If you want to write the code in SQL, so you include the SQL HPP SQL header, and then this simple code try to do the vector add, adding two vectors together. So we have two array of a vector, and inside that function, as you can see, we create a queue. This is the first step in SQL. You always create a queue and submit your code to that queue. Then, from these array, or buffer, or vector, or pointer, it can be anything, or even shared pointer, you create this SQL buffer, and you pass the size of this buffer, and the type of the buffer. This scope that you can see, the queue has been created, the buffer has been created, is called host scope. So in the host scope, you allow to write any normal C++ code. The next scope, it is a queue submit scope. In the queue submit scope, you basically submit your OpenCL kernel, which has been written in the C++ language, to the queue. And then the queue will uh, be schedule that kernel and execute that kernel through the wrong time schedule. So in the queue submit scope, you have a parameter called command group handler. And this command group handler allow you to create the device type pointer or device type object 
let's say, for uh, from the buffer that you have created here. So this object, which is called accessor, allow you to access this buffer on the device. So an accessor can be a read mode accessor, can be a write accessor, or can be a read write accessor. So you can submit, you can have different accessors, and you can have different kernel in the code, and submit them in, in any way in the queue. But the runtime scheduler will find the dependencies between the accessor and run the kernel in the same order that it should be. So the order execution of the kernel, and basically the dependencies between the accessor will be handled by the SQL back. So in this, the, the next scope is basically a kernel scope. Kernel scope is basically whatever you're writing inside this part of 4. Anything inside that part of 4 is going to run on the GPU. So you write the, any Lambda expression or C++11 code, but it's restricted C++11. For example, you cannot have global variable here. You cannot have virtual function here. <laughs> These are not supported obviously. So you will write your kernel here, whatever the kernel is supposed to do when using these accessors. So usage of the accessor are pretty much like an array. So you can consider it as an array. So you still have this operator in order to dereference any element inside that accessor. After defining that kernel, basically, that's it. That's done. The SQL compiler will compile this code, extract the OpenCL kernel of it, generate an SPRV out of that kernel. A sphere, sorry, at the moment. A sphere 1.2, let's say. Generate an sphere code from this kernel, and the host compiler will load that sphere to the OpenCL, through the, through the OpenCL built-in program, and basically build the kernel from it, and run it for you. So everything happened at the compile time. So we, we don't compile the source code at runtime. We generate the sphere at compile time by ourselves and load that sphere and build the kernel out of it at runtime. So that three scope that I explained, host scope, queue submit scope, and kernel scope are the main three uh, basic important scope that we have to deal with whenever we are to convert any existing framework to SQL framework. So you can see later on, I will use this in an argument and I will explain why this theory is possible. So why SQL and why not OpenCL? First of all, Eigen kernels follow a heavily C++ template program. If you look at the Eigen, Eigen code, basically, it's all template-based programming of expression tree. And SQL has the ability and it allows you basically to device a template-based kernel, any C++-based kernel, similar to CUDA, on OpenCL. OpenCL 1.2 does not support C++. So it does not support template-based program. Also, some vendor may add some extension for it, but it's not part of the OpenCL 1.2 stand. From OpenCL 2.1, they will start supporting C++, then they will start support template. But there's still a problem with that. And the problem with that is, although you can write a template code inside the kernel, the kernel name cannot be templated. So in that case, if a code like Eigen, which has been templated based on the type, if you're going to have a kernel for float, you're going to have a kernel for double, for any separate type, you have to rewrite the kernel and basically call a template function that you wrote to it. So that, uh, that, that basically caused a lot of trouble for you in order to write the code. Well, SQL will handle it, because SQL supports C++ template program. Another thing is Eigen, especially the Eigen Tensor backend, has been designed specifically for CUDA at the beginning in order to run on NVIDIA GPU. And because NVIDIA GPU CUDA supports single source programming, the kernel has been written in a way that you have one source code and that source code contains the kernel. So single will support single source programming style for you, so there's no need to write separate kernel basically for each operation. The same code that you write, you can say that this method inside that struct or function can be a kernel. 
if we were using open cell back and then you had to implement this uh, basically every single part of the kernel by ourselves. What is the challenge to implement eigenback? The main challenge is, as I said, eigen has been designed, eigen tensor has been designed with the assumption that it's going to have, is going to be used by CUDA and Threadful C++. CUDA and Threadful C++, which is running on CPU, use standard pointer type for basically data storage. So you can, in CUDA, you can easily say void star x and then say that CUDA malloc. And that void star x can be used on the device. You cannot dereference that void star x on the host side, but you can do any arithmetic operation on that. And you can build your expression based on that. So Eigen has been designed with the fact that all of the data node going to be a pointer. There is a limitation in OpenCL that. OpenCL does not allow you to basically use, create a pointer not connected to a kernel and run that pointer anywhere that you want and basically reuse the same pointer inside a different kernel because OpenCL cannot guarantee you that the same uh, mem data memory that you're accessing by, the memory that you're accessing by this kernel would be the same address as the memory going to be accessed by another kernel and that's the reason OpenCL always gives you an object. So that limitation is related to the underlying limitation. So that CSI pointer basically caused an issue if we wanted to keep the same eigen interface. So the proposed solution that we had here was to introduce a pointer mapper structure. So the pointer mapper structure tried to help us to have a pointer as a front-end for the user in order to build the expression in Eigen and then optimize, basically add another parameter to Eigen template function called pointer class, which is a nested template parameter, which later on allow us at compile time to convert that type to another type that we want to be on the device. And once we have that pointer mapper class, and we have that the, uh, basically the, the, the pointer template, nested template parameter as part of the item template, then we would be able to reconstruct the expression at compile time on the kernel and use that expression. Uh, and converting all of these pointers that we have created to the actual data device at compile time. So our pointer mapper class, basically, at the front end, return a virtual pointer. So it's nothing but a virtual pointer to the user. So we just create our own version of the memory management, which whenever you, you, whenever you want to create it, whenever you, are, you, are, you, you want to basically call that allocate, it will give you the pointer. And you can use that pointer in order to build your expression. But in the back end, we have basically one-to-one one, uh, one -one correspondence between that virtual pointer and our actual signal buffer on the device. So basically, our pointer mapper on the memory allocation create a key value parameter in the map structure, which the key is the virtual pointer going to be returned to the user, and the value of that would be a signal buffer. On the memory manipulation level, whenever you want to do the arithmetic operation, for example, on the pointer, on the host side, we do all the operation on that pointer, save it there. And because of that, you're leaving enough gap between each, value, each of the key, which is going to be the size of the buffer, in order to allow you to do all of the arithmetic operation over that pointer and not overlapping with another pointer as a key. So on the memory deallocation, again, we retrieve it and we delete it. When we are going to the device side, we try to find the original key part of the pointer and then extract the offset and add that offset to the actual device memory and then use that offset for doing any, for example, partial copying of the data from hosted device. So, the next step after adding this pointer mapper is 
expression reconstruction. In order to explain that, I actually try to visualize it in an example because that makes it more understandable. An expression in eigen always represents that in that form. So you can see in eigen, you can say a equal to b times c plus d. So that's, that's basically an, a, a representation of an eigen expression. I can generate an expression tree out of that expression that you're writing. And this is a compile time expression tree. It's all template based, which basically the operator is templated. The type of the data has been templated. And all of uh, these non-terminal nodes has been templated through the different struct or type. For example, for this one would be a tensor assign OP, which the left hand side is a tensor map and the right-hand side is tensor binary OP, and the left-hand side of the tensor binary would be tensor binary OP with multiply, and the right-hand side of that tensor binary OP would be the tensor map. And for this tensor binary OP, which has been nested inside that tensor binary OP, it would be a left-hand side of tensor map and right-hand side of tensor map. So that's the very basic the eigen build expression. The reason that they build that expression tree is they give them the benefit of kernel fusion. So when you write such an expression, instead of doing the operation one by one, this is a tensor. Each of these A, B, C are a container for a tensor, which we call a tensor map. And at runtime, when you run it in the kernel, every thread in parallel loads every element. When the element has been loaded from global memory of GPU to the private memory, they are going to basically do all this operation in a row. First, they times B by C, and then add the D, load the D on it, and then they assign it to the A, and then they write it on the uh, basic the GPU, instead of creating three kernels for that times plus and equal. So that kernel fusion gives them kernel fusion. Having that kernel fusion gives them a huge boost, especially when that three tend to get bigger and bigger. So that is the expression tree that you're dealing with. And the reason that you're using expression tree is because it gives us the ability to have the kernel fusion. So now I'm going through the expression reconstruction for each different scope that I was talking about. The first scope is a host scope. The scope that it's purely going to run on the host. And we are going to basically reconstruct the expression for the device at compile time. So this is the expression tree that we have, which is trying to do A equal to B times C plus D. The first thing that we do, if we want to convert this expression, if we want to basically convert this expression at compile time to a device expression, we need to capture all of the stateful functor. We need to capture all of the node. And we need to preserve the order of that node. We need to convert all of the we need to convert all of the virtual pointer to a buffer and from that buffer, as you saw in the command group handler, to the accessor. And those accessors are going to be used on the device. So the first step is we basically number this terminal in a dead first order at compile time. So because it's template-based programming, you can go always recursively go to that expression and at compile time com number every node. So you will start from that first, you have one here, then you come here and come this line, you have one here. For every terminal node, you add plus one, and then you return the result of that to the other one, and the other one add the result of its charted parent. So this one put one here, put one here, this one sum this to one, pass two here. This one get one here, and these two, three here, one and three, four here. So it tells you that you have four nodes here. So when you when you when you at compile time, when you go through that expression and reach through the root node, you have a number four, which says that this is the total number of leaf nodes that you have needed to be compiled. The next step is going through that and label each of these nodes. So as I said, you always use the depth first order. So we have four here. So it means that we are going to start labeling from zero to three, four minus one. So again here, we use the zero here. We know that number zero has been gone. One has been added to this clause. Then it comes to that, put one here. Comes here, zero and one is gone. Two goes here. 
one and two has gone, it comes here, three goes here, and then come up. So all of the node has been labeled in the depth first order. So I know that this is zero, this is one, this is two, this is three. The next step is capturing all of the stateful functor at compile time. So all of the functor in eigen is template based, but they are stateful. So we cannot reinstantiate the same functor on the device because on the host they may have passed something which is going to be used there. So if you're going to reconstruct this expression on the device and assuming the result going to be correct, you have to capture all of the stateful functor, you have to capture all the dimension stuff, anything which is going to be stateful. So for the nodes, we don't do anything, but for non-terminal operator, which has this functor like assign plus times, we capture them because each of them may have some element inside their stroke which is going to be a stateful. So again, we'll traverse the tree and create a tree of functor, which is nothing but capture all of these instantiation of these functors. Q submit scope. As I said, Q submit scope is the scope that we have the command group handler. So this is the scope that we can convert the expression tree to uh, basically, we can convert all of the buffer node to the accessor node, which is the, the type of the data can be accessed on the device. So here, in order to capture all of them at compile time, we create a top-lob accessor. So we, we implemented a topple method, and this topple method is not a steady topple method, because we cannot use the steady topple method inside the kernel, because the steady topple method is not a standard function, and inside the kernel, we can only use a standard layout C++ kernel. That's the restriction. So we implemented our own topple. We traverse the tree. For every leaf node, we capture their buffer and can create an accessor of that buffer and put it in a top, in, in a top of list. But the order is exactly the depth first order. So I know that I always traverse the tree the same way that I traverse for labeling them. And these topple always have the same order as the other three. So, I've generated that accessors. I've generated uh, all of those, I've captured all of those stateful nodes. I've labeled all of the expression tree. Now is the time to reconstruct this in the kernel scope. Kernel scope is a device scope. So I have this information, I have this label. So based on this information that I have here, which is a functor expression, I'm I know what is the corresponding node for each node here. This is called a placeholder expression. This is an expression which only have a label number, nothing more. So, and this is the accessor which is going to be exactly correspond to the number that you can see here. So D will go here, C will go here, B will go here, and A will go here. And this hollow node is going to be replaced by equal, plus, and times. So, I will reconstruct this expression while in this time A, B, C, D has the accessor instead of the actual. So now I have the full expression which has been generated at compile time on the device. So I managed to transfer this, whatever the expression you are creating and pass it to the device. Then I can run that expression on the device and the, the rest of it is going to be handled by C. So this is the first step of basically enabling SQL for uh, uh, what, what can we say? The, the enabling SQL backend for TensorFlow. So we run the benchmark and we, at the first step we compare it with Core i7 CPU backend, which has four cores on Intel that we have, and we compare it with R9 Fairy Nano, basically GPU, rather by AMD. So the the diagram that you can see here is a uh, logarithmic scale. So, if, because I wanted to put all of them in one graph, I didn't want to have long, tall, and not readable, so I basically convert the difference between logarithmic scale. So, the CPU version, this, the benchmark of the eigen is available in the eigen benchmark, and I can run it on the machine and see the result. But the 
we run the benchmark for the CPU for 4 thread, 8 thread, 12 thread, and 16 thread. The best result that we could achieve was for 4 thread because the actual physical core was 4. So adding more thread doesn't give us any more speed up at this level. So as you can see, there are cases like contraction that we can achieve five to up to five times speed up over the CPU over the parallel CPU versions. Or there are cases like mass function that we have we can achieve so up to eight times the speed up over the parallel CPU version. And there are cases actually you're losing the performance. One of these cases that you're losing performance is this chip operation, the tensor chipping operation and the, basically the row major and column major. So everything in IGEM is templated based on the row major and column major, and you can choose at compile time whether or not the, your data level is row major or column major. So the, one of the reasons that you're losing performance here is due to the fact that in AMD GPU, if you just try to access the memory randomly, you will lose a lot of performance. So the chipping operation tend to basically slice the tensor based on the column and row that you're passing. So for example, if you have a 2D matrix and you want to say that I want the column 3 or I want the row 4, it will try to basically strip the rest through, the, through that way and create an output tensor of 1D from that row. But reading the memory on that row, if for example the data has been set in a column major, or if reading the memory on that column when the data has been set to the row major would generate an awful performance. So another thing is tensor reduction. The current version of reduction which is here at the moment is uh, not the best reduction algorithm that we wrote. So that reduction is going to change soon. Uh, the first level we just wanted to enable, so we use the same uh, made the same reduction uh, functor that they wrote for CPU, so we didn't write our own functor backend for the, for the reduction. The way that it works in their case is, because they're running it on the CPU, they are telling, telling each thread to read the chunk of data, reduce it to one, read the chunk of data, reduce it to one. While if you try to do that in AMD for a large case, you get a very bad result, because you have to tell thread zero, read, read zero, thread one, read one, and again, all of them should go to whatever is the size of thread, and read the other bunch of it all together in a row in order to have the quality memory access. So because we use their memory, their, their basically functor at the moment as a backend, so we didn't get good result, but it's, it's going pretty much soon to be replaced in the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah, that work was basically the first work of Enabling OpenCell backend for TensorFlow. And by enabling for TensorFlow, it means that enabling through the Eigen Tensor backend. As I said, it can be managed to achieve five times the speed of the multi threaded CPU, the tune version of the multi threaded CPU, which uses all those um, minus AVX enabled, minus SSE enabled, and they were using MM intrinsic memory in order to load the data by using the vectorization. The future work is basically vectorizing all of these kernel. So at the moment, the current version does not use the vectorization. So it doesn't get the benefit of loading four elements at the same time if you're using float four, float eight, or whatever is the basic size of the vectorization. So we are trying to vectorize this in order to improve the performance. That is one of the things. As I mentioned, we are going to uh, improve the reduction operation. We are going to increase the improve the performance of the reduction by adding our reduction operation to that. And we are going to complete, complete the registration of all TensorFlow operations. So at the moment, we have TensorFlow has something like 1,000 tests, which basically go through 850 different font or kernel that they have and test all of them thoroughly. So at the moment, we, we, we enabled the majority of the kernels in TensorFlow I think the current situation is from that thousand tests, 33 tests failed for SQL, and that is due to not register that operation for SQL, or basically uh, some of them related to some of the limitations that at the moment we have. For example, they're using the assumption of the fact that they can, you can use the pointer inside the struct, creating the, that's the basic of the 
specific feature of the CUDA, which allow you to create a pointer independent from the kernel, as I mentioned at the beginning, the memory issue, the data storage issue. So we are trying to enable that and make that work as well. So that's the current state of the Eigen and TensorFlow backend that we have. Uh, and apart from that, we are developing a SQL class, which is going to be a SQL version of Blast library. But this library is going to use different technique. They are going, we are going to use a similar technique as Eigen for Blast. All of you know that Blast has a strict interface that every node should be use that interface in order to call. So most of the Blast library, even the Blast library which is going to be used in Eigen at the moment, the problem with that is you have to break the expression tree and you have to extract the data, pass it to the Blast library, get the result, and then pass it to the nest of the rest of the expression tree. So if you have an expression tree and you want to be, for example, one of, one of the nodes in that expression tree, you want to use Blast, that expression tree should break into three expression tree. And basically, that means creating three separate kernels. But the technique that we're trying to use with SQL Blast is to use an expression tree base of Blast, which at compile time, again, any operation of the expression, uh, any operation from the Blast interface going to be embed uh, to the existing expression tree and use that and still be part of one kernel without changing the Blast interface, using the same interface for the Blast. So that's some of the work that we're doing at the moment. So at the end, I have to thank the LPGPU2 project, which is part of, which is basically all of the work that we did is partially supported by LPGPU2 project, which is a Horizon 2020 EU funded project. And uh, also the Knowledge Transfer Partnership Program in the UK, which is KTP, which is supporting me to work on that project. So I have to thank them. So if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you.